and I am Ahmedabad and is based out of Delhi. He's an avid reader and is fond of music and loves to tinker and explore new things in his free time. So it's a pleasure to have you, sir, here as one of the speaker to this workshop. I welcome you, sir, and request you to bless the audience with your knowledge and experience. And today, you will introduce the applications of AI, that is artificial intelligence in the industry to our audience. So welcome you, sir. Uh, thank you, Anand. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. It's a Saturday morning. I'll try to uh, keep the session interesting, light. And uh, I don't know the, how the format is working, but we'll be happy to take questions in between. But of course, we will have some time towards the end. Um, my understanding is that the audience today is a mix of some uh, faculty members and some students. And uh, uh, I'll uh, assume in some places that uh, uh, not a lot of knowledge is available. So we'll keep it simple. Uh, but I hope it would be fun. So let me start sharing my screen. I'll run through a small presentation while I keep talking. So actually, we have a mix of audience for sure. And it ranges right from class 12 students. You know, I was a little skeptical of actually accepting him in the course. But then AICT said, it's OK. So we have right from class 12 till PhDs. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then that would be fun. So maybe it's something will be easy for some and a, a little difficult for some, but hopefully it would be an interesting, interesting session. Let me begin. Uh, sorry. OK, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, can you see the presentation? Yeah, it's yes, there. Yeah. OK, excellent. So uh, the topic for today is how data science is being used in real business scenarios. And let's uh, begin. So I have picked a, a small clip it from a Dilbert comic. I'll get, take a, a pause, and maybe you can just uh, go through it. Uh, so I, the reason why I brought it up, there's a lot of uh, excitement about this space in various media sections in the industry. Why are we so excited about it? Why are we so buoyant about it? Is it just the hype around it? Uh, so uh, the thing is, there are a lot of things that are, uh, I was actually talking to a few school going children and their parents. And I think a lot of perception often is created by the movies that we see. Hollywood, I think, has made that perception that a lot of intelligent robots and machines will be taking over the world or would be assisting people in various ways. I believe some of uh, you would be able to recognize stars from Interstellar or Matrix and these things. I mean, this is a perception many a times. I know many of the people in this audience uh, would find it a little kiddish. But um, for everyone, the thing is, there are a lot of things which are already happening in the AI space. Uh, which are impacting our daily lives in so many ways. Uh, when we go to photo albums today, and they are able to recognize faces of our childhood friends, uh, even, even the uh, images that we are not able to recognize ourselves at times, uh, there is some intelligence coming in the background. For that matter, even when we... Uh, I hope... I, yeah, just please keep it uh, mute if you are not uh, talking. That would be helpful. Uh, when we are doing a Google search, then it auto uh, fills up options. And again, it is an intelligent way that it is providing options for our search to us, right? Uh, when we go to Netflix or we do some shopping, it, uh, the uh, system in the background runs some algorithm to suggest things that we might also like to buy or view. And uh, again, this is something, it is not that these are the most popular options, but something which is related to profiles like yours, some people like you who are uh, demographically or age bracket wise, looking or buying things similar to what you are doing. And that is how those recommendations are being made. And uh, we all uh, today, when we are using Uber or even in our own car, when we put up a Google map, to go from our place to our friend's place. So what happens in the background, it does not give you the shortest route 
but the least time consuming route depending on the traffic it's <coughs> real time analysis that is going in the back uh, i can hear some background noise if you can keep on mute please thank you okay so uh, there is some intelligence running in these things in the background so uh, the and these things are all impacting us on a daily basis in various ways so there is a lot of intelligence that is already being built into our applications uh, but that also uh, does not mean that it is only the likes of facebook and google who are doing the uh, stuff in ai and machine learning there are a lot of other applications that are also impacting us today so i'll uh, just take a few examples which are again reasonably common when we go to a website and we need some help uh, and ask and uh, want to chat with some uh, person to get more information it's very likely that at the initial level there is a bot running in the background which is giving you answers and only if the answer if the questions are becoming too specific or complex then it is handed over to a human agent so again these bots are intelligent bots which are giving us answers to regular questions that are coming up uh, another example is you go to a doctor and the doctor asks you to uh, get a ct scan or a mri done again uh, this is happening started to happen not so much in indian context but still in lot of places where the machines are already trained on typical uh, symptoms uh, that are there uh, typical diagnostics and the first level of opinion can very well be taken by a machine generated algorithm another uh, application it could be in the case of credit card uh, so we are all using debit cards and credit cards and typically you might have observed that if you uh, ever make a transaction which is somewhat different from your regular transactions say you are normally doing transactions below rupees 10000 and if you do a transaction say of 30000 rupees or something then the bank would give you a call looking at the anomalous behavior that you are having it might be a genuine one but they are tracking it all the transactions on a uh, ongoing basis to see if there is any anomaly that can be detected and another uh, use case another thing that is now becoming pretty common in so many scenarios you go to a mall you go to a market uh, from a social distancing point of view from assessing that which particular aisles are having more traffic at a particular time of the day there could be some uh, crowd level analytics that is going on in the background to see if they have to make some changes to their store layout or uh if something has to be implemented from a regulatory perspective like uh, social distancing and all so uh these are things which are again pre becoming pretty common uh, and something which is impacting us even if we are not aware of it at times i'll also talk about a few interesting things uh, which are having a lot of media attention so self driving cars is another story uh, which is now gradually becoming a reality Google on its campus is running self-driving cars, uh, Waymo, as many of you might already be aware. These are, of course, very complex systems uh, ne needing a lot of reinforcement learning, uh, those type of algorithms in the background. Uh, and it is likely that as uh, some more time passes by, they will we will be able to see more of them on roads in different locations. Uh, uh, relatively. more common place example again uh, uh, in india also these are available but i actually saw it in uh, a location in us so homes are actually having uh, robots vacuum cleaners which actually uh, are able to identify the layout of the house uh, there is a wall it has to the robot turns automatically in case there is a stair in front of it it stops and uh, so that it does not fall and break and at the end of the day it uh, goes back to its charging station to recharge itself so this is already happening and these are intelligent robots they try to learn from the layout 
and while they are collecting dust and dirt, uh, they are able to modify their route and uh, make it, I mean, they can be uh, uh, working without any human intervention. So uh, Roomba is one such example, and I saw that there are similar things available now in India as well. And this is a very exciting thing. I don't know if uh, any of you have uh, seen uh, information on Boston Analytics, Boston Dynamics. So these are, uh, this is a company, and there are a few others, which are doing like human-like robots and uh, machines which can work in remote locations, even from a army or battlefield type of a scenario or industrial warehouses, these can become very effective. They are like, uh, I'll, I just uh, had links to a couple of videos, which I'll show now. Um, let's see. There's one more uh, related one. So this is a robot they call Atlas, and then they have also a robot, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but it's a dog type of a robot, uh, which they have created. So yeah, I'm just taking a pause here. Uh, so this, this is a very interesting uh, company. They are doing some very interesting stuff. You should look at more of uh, the products that they are developing. There are other things in the media which are very exciting and interesting. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about a humanoid that was given, I think, uh, citizenship by uh, United Arab Emirates um, by the name of Sophia. So again, a human-like robot uh, having a lot of intelligence uh, built in, in terms of expressions, in terms of responses. It is also pretty close to how a human interacts. So these, I mean, there are companies which are trying to do all sort of things using AI. Uh, and uh, I would not say that they are like at the uh, level where it is becoming, in a, becoming commercialized, but a lot of ideas happening in this space. Now, uh, before I move on, uh, so I, the idea I have tried to present is that there are there is a lot happening which is impacting us. There's a lot which is future, futuristic, but still can be very interesting as we move on. But going from here, I'll uh, there are in all the traditional industries like manufacturing, retail, healthcare, banking, we have got a lot of stories which companies are uh, building where. AI, machine learning, data science is already starting to make an impact. Now, what I have, uh, what we will be doing in the next part of uh, the presentation, I'll take uh, aviation as an example, uh, airlines industry, and we will see how uh, uh, there are uh, use cases which are impacting the entire value chain from an industry perspective, right? Um, I just need a quick nod or some response to understand that I am on right track, I am audible, things are making sense. Can anybody just say something? Yes, sir, you are audible. All right, good. Yeah, so it's very difficult these days in uh, when you are not having any audience in front of you, whether <laughs> how things are progressing. Great. Yeah, so let me move forward then. Um, I, now, what we are trying to do, as I said, 
we will look at aviation as an example but very similar stories can be done in any industry that we want to target it could be pharma it could be uh, retail or anything so uh, looking at aviation as an example i have uh, divided the value chain in three parts the first is focused on revenue that is the top line or sales a uh, customer facing type of things i'll just uh, have a pointer here i think that would help yeah so the first one is related to sales or what is impacting the revenue of the company second is a uh, second vertical is more around how to decrease the direct costs or bring in operation efficiencies and third part of the value chain is more on process improvements or indirect costs that can be reduced using some intelligent algorithms right uh, so moving to the first one we will spend some time on the slide just to give you a feel of the type of things we are doing when we look at a player and try to address the problems so forecasting sales is something that every business is always interested in uh, we always want to know how we can uh, what is the sales that we might be able to get can we do some promotions to increase the sales so there are intelligent algorithms i mean it has been something which has been done traditionally also but there are things which ai is helping making the forecasts better the second uh, story can be around marketing mix management now uh, what happens every business has a marketing budget uh, and in order to increase the sales the company would be allocating this budget to different channels like tv uh, radio print social media and uh, what is the best mix of uh, uh, channels how much budget should be allocated to each of the channels is always a challenge the intent always is how to maximize the return on investment how do we maximize uh, the customers uh, that we can acquire through different channels so again artificial intelligence uh, machine learning algorithms can help in giving us better idea about how the marketing mix can be planned understanding voice of customer this is a use case to, so the red ones we will discuss in a little detail in the next few slides understanding voice of customer is uh, understanding what the customer is trying to say what is the feedback customer has on our products or our, or our or on our services so we will look at this one in more detail in the next slide personalized recommendation system uh, say uh, we, it's always good to know your customer better can we make an offering which suits him or her better uh, for example a customer in a business class would be having very different requirements compared to a customer in a uh, economy class or a customer who is a corporate traveler or business traveler going for a business meeting would have a very different requirement compared to a family which is going on a vacation by flight to another destination so can we if we understand the customers better we might be able to make certain recommendations which are more personalized more specific to their requirements uh, the next one of course can be a, a chatbot a virtual assistant which can uh, address customer queries and another use case could be uh, can we have so airlines normally have a dynamic pricing policy you might have seen that closer to the date of travel your ticket prices would increase if you are planning a, a holiday or something and uh, very often uh, airline companies also do this that say world cup is being planned in sharjah and there's a india pakistan match coming up then flights from india to sharjah or from pakistan to sharjah would uh, typically go very high closer to those events so uh, this is another thing where uh, ai can help uh, in terms of suggesting what could be better pricing i mean look at it from a business point of view don't look at it from your individual point of view uh, because you might feel oh this is so bad ai is not doing the right thing but from a business perspective it is going to be good they will be able to generate better revenues right moving into the second vertical which is around operational excellence and cost efficiencies so uh, 
normally in any product like aircrafts have got so many parts and you need to maintain those aircrafts on a regular basis traditionally you would have some periodic checks but today with advent of sensors which are attached to almost all the different parts you are getting lot of data from these uh, how the parts are performing iot sensors iot data is coming in and we can uh, see if a particular part is deteriorating or it is needing some sort of maintenance then those things can be predicted in advance so rather than having a periodic check for everything after every 3 months or 6 months you can look at Uh, that okay, these parts might need a replacement or some sort of uh, maintenance after uh, say six weeks also, if uh, there is a challenge on that particular product product part particular part. There could be things like image based analytics. I'll talk about it in uh, the next slides. Uh, inventory of parts is also one thing, and we will again talk in more detail, uh, which is. uh something that every business needs to look at so over investing in inventory does not make sense you have put in money and you are not utilizing it and under uh, investing in inventory uh gives the risk of a downtime for the aircrafts or for uh, various things that are there in uh, being used various products that are being used um another story could be around a ai powered digital check in something particularly in post covid era is becoming more and more a reality so rather than having uh, people to uh, uh, manually do things airlines are looking at options where they can scan the face of person and tally it to the documents directly so that there is practically a touchless way to check in there could be other stories like crowd analytics at scale so uh, as i was sharing in the previous slide uh, that when we see a, a lot of people in the lounge or on the airport are they all wearing masks are they maintaining proper distance those type of things can be done proposed to the airline and uh, there are lot of management dashboards which can be uh, having analytics related to customer data sales data operations data this need not be um artificial intelligence or intelligent algorithms but this is all related to data science part of data science as a overall ecosystem and moving to the third vertical uh so again i'll talk about one of the use cases here when we say extracting information out of unstructured data so uh, there are forms and uh, you have to take information out of that for your own records or cargo labels are there i mean airlines does not only uh, carry people it carries a lot of cargo also so for cargoes normally the labels that are there the information has to be extracted from those labels that can be put in certain databases for further use so can we extract that information automatically right uh, again there can be virtual assistants uh, or chatbots to support technical staff we can also have video analytics for various safety and security measures say there is a particular restricted area uh, for the airline and you need a verification before a person goes in you can use some sort of face recognition uh, type of algorithms there and workflow management is again a very common challenge in almost every business situation uh, as an illustration it could be say the bay allocation on an airport to different carriers and different flights uh, that needs to be seen i mean there could be a high priority flight that despite whatever allocation we have done beforehand we need to accommodate so there could be some intelligence built into our algorithms for such things uh, so there can be so many more cases i have just put some uh, things as a illustration how we would look at an industry what sort of problem areas we can identify and address using uh, machine learning algorithms i will be talking about four use cases in the next four slides uh, things that we have worked upon in the past for different players uh, intentionally i have kept use cases from the three verticals and also uh, in terms of the underlying algorithms or technologies 
the first one is around uh, voice of customer is around nlp ner type of thing image based analytics is more around machine vision managing inventory of parts is more around uh, structured data uh, and uh, uh, regression type of algorithms and extracting information out of unstructured data like handwritten forms or cargo labels are more like ocr uh, type of techniques that are used so uh, this would just give you a flavor you uh, those of you who are working on various algorithms and data science problems can relate uh, how each of these is being utilized in industry context so i'll move to the next slide now um now uh, this is the first story first use case that i'll be talking about uh, as i was sharing that for every business one common challenge is that they want to understand what the customer is saying what is the feedback good or bad what actions can be taken to improve the customer experience that is a very common uh, thing people want to do uh, the issue uh, uh, is that many a times it's a voluminous data the customer feedback very often is in a free text format so uh, i mean typical feedback forms might have some things rated on a scale of 1 to 10 but then there is a, a text box where the customer fills in the feedback which is always most relevant but most difficult to analyze right uh, and the challenge can further be accentuated that it could be in different languages so for an airline uh, the feedback could be in chinese korean german other than english and it's a manual task typically to understand what is the customer feedback in general so very labor intensive even if there are say 8 or 10000 forms coming in a month from different customers to extract any insights which are actionable is always a challenge i i hope you can understand the uh, concern i mean it's not a trivial problem to solve um and uh, there are further challenges many a times uh, there is a human bias also when somebody is trying to look through the form uh, because maybe the customer is talking about cabin comfort and uh, the person who is looking at the form classifies it wrongly under a different category so there could be those type of challenges that uh, are inherent to the manual process the existing process um, and as you will appreciate it is also not good enough to know that say 70% people are very happy with the airline right uh, i mean you want uh, you what you want to know is what are the things people are saying positive things about and what are the things people are sharing their concerns about right uh, even if somebody is able to say that okay uh, x percent of people have given a positive feedback that does not help much so we need uh, some analysis to get uh, to make action take actions some actionable insights are required basically so let's look at an example and that might make things a little more clear say one customer has given a feedback that food was good especially the risotto it looked fresh and the portions were adequate and we also have say another customers another passengers feedback cabin was okay but it could have been better seat were seats were not so comfortable so what you also see that typically uh, humans when they put feedback they might uh, use different ways to say the same thing Uh, there could be sarcasm involved in the same paragraph they might be talking good about one thing and uh, bad about another thing so these are typical complexities when you are analyzing such thing manually right uh, now using machine learning what we were doing we tried to extract various entities uh, you might have already read through any other type of uh, approach so uh, entities like risotto cabin seat can be seen in these feedback then we uh, aggregated them under certain categories like risotto would go under food cabin under ambiance seat under comfort and then uh, looking at the sentence what is the sentiment that the person is displaying about that entity so for risotto the customer is pretty positive for cabin it is okay not so good not so bad and for seat the sentiment is negative or low 
So if we are able to automatically extract these entities and categorize them and get the sentiments for that, and then aggregate this information across the passengers, then we can come up with a dashboard which might look something like this, that so many people are talking negative and so many people are talking positive about certain things. And this information can further be having filters on filters on the route or um, uh, sector or business class or economy class or things like that. So you can slice and dice the data in some ways to make it very contextual that, okay, this particular type of passengers are finding these things not so good. And then the customer service team can very well take certain actions to make that, uh, to rectify that problem. Uh, so this is one, one story which we implemented and a uh, pretty high level of uh, success uh, we got. Uh, it is running into production for some airlines. Uh, I hope it's making sense. I'll move to the next story. Uh, if uh, anybody has any questions, we can talk in between also or else I'll take it towards the end. Okay. Yeah. Anyone wants to say something? All right, I'll, I'll move ahead then. Uh, so another very interesting uh, example, and uh, this is a machine vision case. Uh, so what is it that customers most often talk about uh, in, in a flight context? What brings that perception that this is a good flight or a bad flight? Typically things like food that is being served or entertainment or uh, the way uh, the custom uh, the air hostess behaves those are the things that are uh, making the biggest impact and food of course is one of them now typically passengers are getting food in trays when they are on flight right uh, the issue is customers often do not consume everything some of the things are not eaten at all some are partially eaten and some are fully eaten right that is how it always happens uh, but there's no way to understand uh, what is it that customers or passengers are liking or not liking. Uh, and there's no easy way to analyze that. So uh, one solution that we implemented was uh, say each of these trays at the end of the flight can be photographed and uh, using certain object detection models, each of the food items like juice or egg or things like that in that tray can be uh, see, uh, found out and a status can be see, uh, also put against each of them, whether it is fully consumed or partially consumed or not consumed at all, right? And again, uh, we can uh, filter it on different sectors, different class of uh, passengers uh, and come out with some insights that on this particular sector, normally you find that people are not having enough beef or pork or on this particular sector, this thing is uh, uh, running very well, maybe some deserts or something. And accordingly, uh, the menu can be modified or things can be changed by the uh, food vendor. So this was, and interestingly, this uh, similar use case we found is also being used in some restaurant in uh, US where uh, when you go to the till to make the payment, you don't need to interact with the cashier uh, on the point of sale system, you can very well just show it to a camera and it automatically calculates the bill for your tray, the items that you are about to consume and gives you a bill. So uh, these things again are getting implemented commercially in various uh, scenarios. I'll move to the third story. Uh, this is more uh, around structured data, as I was sharing. Uh, we saw something on NER and NLP. We saw something on machine vision being used. This is another story, but this is around structured data. I have used it in the context of inventory, or we can very well use also in context of sales forecasting. But idea here is that typically how... Uh, Sorry, sir, we are not getting your voice. 
Yeah, sir, are you not audible? Achal sir, you are not audible. I think someone has muted him. So please unmute yourself, I, I think. Yeah, somebody had muted me, I believe. Can I, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Yes, uh, where did you lose me? Uh, did you see the uh, food tray analytics use case completely? Yeah. Okay. So, but so your I'm... screen is also not visible now. Yeah, right now it is not. That's okay. I'll just uh, restart it. Sorry. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. No, no, not no. I'm sorry. Not yet? Not yet. Let me see. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Excellent. Uh, and uh, just reconfirming, so I completed this use case and I believe all of you were able to see this one, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just uh, uh, start from here. Um, thanks for letting me know. Yeah, so uh, the third story I was talking about is around forecasting of inventory, or it could very well be used for sales forecasting also in various business scenarios. Uh, the thing is, uh, inventory is a uh, typical problem. You don't want to have unnecessary inventory lying because it's a cost to the company. Uh, you have put in money and you are not utilizing that money. At the same time, you don't want uh, inventory to be low. You don't want a stock out situations because that could result in a downtime and impact your business in general, right? Uh, traditionally, uh, inventory or sales, the only way has been to look at the historical data for that particular product for last 12 months or 24 months and project it for future, how it would look like, and you try to maintain a level of inventory so that you don't stock out, right? Uh, the advantage with machine learning is uh, you can use new data sets, bring in things that you think might impact other than the historical data for that particular product, do some bit of feature engineering, apply your models, and very likely that your results, your forecasting would be better compared to the traditional approach. That is the broad thought. The use case that I have put here is for a retail chain which has got around 50 stores in different parts of the country. This is not India. Uh, and there are around 150 products that the company sells. So there are in all something like 7,500, 8,000 products that you are trying to uh, predict the sales for so that the central warehouse for the company can stock appropriate level for each of those products. That is the idea. And the challenge here often is that these products are all different. Some are very fast moving products like consumer goods. There could be things which are slow moving products or high priced products, different life cycle. Some products could be seasonal in nature. So if you look at it, traditionally it is always it has been a challenge because you have to uh, find the sales data for each of the product and forecast it. In the uh, new scheme of things, you are get, trying to put in more uh, data sets like promotions, holidays, uh, or any events. I mean, some things might sell uh, fa better, faster, closer to say Christmas or Diwali. Um, even weather might be impacting the local weather on certain uh, in store locations might also be impacting the sales uh, in that particular region. So uh, we can get those data sets augment the historical sales data with the new data sets, do a bit of feature engineering, apply models and see how it is looking. The advantage that also, particularly from a sales perspective uh, that we are able to see here is, you can do a lot of scenario analysis like what if analysis, um, just to explain. So what if we apply 
a 10% discount on a particular product in a particular location how do we see the uh, sales respond to that so those type of scenarios can also be built in to our uh, stories i mean when the analysis is being done uh, because we already have the model the forecast available so we can allocate our budgets we can plan our promotions on different products in different locations accordingly well this thing in particular is more relevant for sales but the approach is very similar whether it is inventory management or it is sales forecasting right uh okay i'll move to the fourth story now uh which is extracting information out of cargo labels this is again a very interesting uh, uh use case uh from a airline context as i was sharing that you get lot of cargo packages which have got labels on top of it and somewhere you have to feed that data into your uh, databases when you are processing those packages shipping them out to other locations for various things now all these things do require some sort of manual effort uh, we did something very similar for a us based client which is into package management and locker solutions so what this company does is they have got lockers uh, installed in different apartment complexes and in retail stores and offices and uh, they get packages like something like 2 crore packages in a year from different vendors like amazon ups fedex they get lot of these packages and they are into the last mile delivery so they deliver these packages to the recipients uh, of those packages what the company has done they have installed uh, lockers like this in different apartment complexes and there's a ipad type of an application where the delivery person takes the package puts in the details of the recipient and the corresponding locker for him or her gets opened and he leaves the package there and a notification is also sent to the recipient that you have got a new package which he can uh, collect later now uh, what the solution uh, that was implemented uh, this packet that the delivery person has brought the label that is on top of it it is directly shown to the ipad application uh, which is installed on the locker and automatically the information is extracted out the name the address uh, uh, information that is available in the barcode that all information is automatically extracting ex extracted out and the locker is opens without much of a manual intervention and uh, a notification is also sent directly by the app, uh, ipad application to the recipient that you have received a new packet um i mean uh, in terms of implementation it uses certain ocr models certain field mapping models and certain address matching models which are then compared with uh, i mean address matching models to compare the addresses that have been extracted with the local address database on ipad so this is the workflow that was implemented but a very similar thing can be done or used in case of cargoes or even in terms of extracting information out of forms so you have to fill forms when you are on airport or for uh, covid related information you might have to produce a rt pcr test report or something today when you go to the airport and rather than doing everything manually the first level of information extraction can very well be done directly by using certain algorithms or uh, directly by using certain models on a iphone or a an android phone which the users handle devices that the uh, airport staff could be carrying so this is the uh, idea that we are trying to suggest when we are looking at a airline so uh, again taking a quick pause here uh, we saw aviation as a industry uh, here what are the type of stories that could be there to help in different parts of the value chain for the industry uh, and i said that this is not a comprehensive list there can be so many more use cases and i could also talk about more use cases but i mean just this is to illustrate and how uh, your whatever you are learning today in this workshop uh, uh, over the next 2 3 days and what you must be uh, studying how those things are actually being implemented in real scenarios uh whether it is customer facing things or uh, 
cost saving things so those are the type of illustrations that i wanted to bring to you in these slides right so i'll uh, move to the last segment it's a very small segment comparatively uh one thing which i uh, uh which i would definitely like to bring to all of you uh, from a industry perspective so ai data science all this is very very exciting for sure but we have to also understand something that enterprise solutions or business solutions are much more than just the algorithms and this is extremely important to understand uh, when we are looking at a solution in context of a business or in context of any enterprise uh, architecture it is the ai part is a very very small part the algorithms that we are doing we have to look at the complete data pipeline i have just used an uh, uh, image a uh, aws uh, based uh, data pipeline to illustrate but it could be any other thing like uh, microsoft or uh, i mean any on premise solution or anything but idea here is when we are looking at a data pipeline there could be a lot of different data sources uh, data sources could be i mean today you are having of course traditional structured data bases as well but you have got iot data you have got social media data you have got uh, real time data that is coming in so there could be so many different type of data sources from which the information has to be first extracted um if you would be aware like etl operations extract transform load type of information put that into a data lake then put that on into some data warehouse i mean do some processing put them in a data warehouse uh orchestration all those things somewhere in between you are also applying your ai algorithms and then on the downstream side also you have to either make some dashboards do some analytics put some make some apis that can be consumed by other applications so at, i mean even some of these uh, terms that i'm using might not make all sense right now to some of you but idea what i'm trying to emphasize is it's not just the algorithms which are exciting a solution would need a lot of different components to be worked upon and why this is important from a business point of view i mean as a services company uh there's much more money to be made in the entire data pipeline uh, rather than just the algorithms thing so the data engineering actually takes the bulk of revenue today in the market when you are implementing solutions for uh, other enterprises so this is one thing which is very important to understand so i mean uh, while uh, it is fun to know about ai algorithms uh, particularly machine vision type of things there is lot more that happens in the background which is very relevant on in a related note um, what that implies you don't need a team of just data scientists you need a data science team what i am trying to say here is uh, a data science team would have lot of different people there would be data engineers there would be people who are experts in visualization on tools like tableau power bi and all there would be people who would be very good with tools like informatica or snowflake for data warehousing thing so other than the data scientists those who are working on the algorithms so and you would also need business analysts you might need a, a delivery manager or somebody to orchestrate the entire exercise so it's a team effort it's not just data science right and then the third point is at the end of it you are solving a business problem ai is just a tool and not an end goal uh, so we have to be aware that customers are uh, not so much bothered how you are implementing a solution they are not really looking at i mean for a technology person it could be very exciting that he or she has worked in a ai uh, model and come up with some very exciting solution but finally it's a business problem that you have solved and business or the customer is often not so bothered whether it is uh, being managed through ai or otherwise so we have to be cognizant of that fact that it's a business problem not ai as a uh, solution that is exciting right and the last point again these are all related in some way but you have to be close to the customer 
when you are making any enterprise level uh, implementations uh, managing expectation adoption and integration so the thing is uh, unlike traditional software ai does not give for example a 100% accuracy so you might be getting say 80% accuracy which is very good but customers might not understand that so much upfront for them you have given a solution and it should work in all the scenarios that could be a possibility uh, integration with existing software systems in the enterprise is also important adoption of your system that you have developed ai tool that you have developed also needs to be seen so some of the things we should be aware of when we are looking at ai implementations in a enterprise context right and okay uh, i have talked about risks that are posed by ai uh, i'll take a pause here another hilarious one from dilbert So uh, I hope you could get the joke. Uh, so AI robot is basically trying to take the job away of senior management here, which it feels is not doing anything relevant. OK, so uh, but getting into the serious part of it, I have just uh, put down a couple of points which I perceive would be uh, good to understand. So uh, first of all, with advent of AI, some jobs might get redundant. I mean, uh, things like if self-driving cars become a reality, which is likely to happen uh, in future. So a lot of drivers might face the heat. Low skill workers where things are repetitive. Um, of course, software is already doing a lot of those things. Uh, even software engineers, actually uh, in some recent articles, I was seeing that AI is already writing a lot of code very fast at a much more uh, in a much more productive manner so the efficiency for writing normal code is increasing i think by 3x or 4x something like that uh, which is uh, something we all need to be aware of i mean normal software uh, coding is not something which is so difficult and very well can be uh, algorithms can be used to even do the work of a typical software engineer. So, I mean, good to be aware that reskilling would be critical in the industry in so many ways uh, where uh, we see a risk, right? The second thing is around ethical, moral, and legal dilemma in case of a lot of these solutions. I have just put down a few uh, to illustrate. So one use case, maybe some of you have already heard of it, is if a self-driving car gets into an accident, then who is to be blamed? Is it uh, the person who owns that self-driving car? Is it uh, something that who uh, created those algorithms? Or who would be uh, the uh, right person? I mean, you cannot. Uh, charge the car itself right so that could be something we should be aware of i mean this is a very odd dilemma but a real dilemma uh, another uh, scenario is discrimination because of inherent biases so as we all know uh, this is uh, i mean artificial intelligence algorithms basically are trained on data right so uh, there was a use case. There's an actual story, I think, in one of the leading investment banks in the US. Uh, so when they were trying to look for compensation for various people, what they were realizing that the algorithms that were developed using machine learning would typically pay the women less compared to the men uh, for same set of skills or same sort of qualifications and the reason was that historically, uh, even in the US, uh, for same skills, women were getting paid less. And since the machine learning algorithms were trained on historic data, they would also have that inherent bias built in somehow. So something we need to be aware of, uh, that could be a risk. At the end of it, these are machines. And then, uh, and uh, actually a, a very interesting uh, related thing, you might have heard Microsoft actually had put up a bot called Tay, 
um, on certain social media sites. Uh, and what it did, initially it was a success, but they had to bring it down because as people started talking to Tay, um, they started giving it more and more racist information and Tay started behaving like a racist. So it would uh, become anti-Semitic, like talk about Jews in a negative tone or things like that. And it became a very embarrassing situation for the company. And they had to pull down uh, the bot from the media, from the site. So those things we have to be aware of. Uh, fake identities, again, is one challenge. I mean, maybe some of you have already seen it. There are videos where uh, uh, characters like Trump and Kejriwal are talking something which they have never said. But it is very easy to create these fake identities uh, on social media using some of the very easy tools that are available. So there are a lot of these uh, ethical and legal dilemmas that we have to look for in AI solutions. And another thing is that many of these models uh, don't have much explain ex explainability uh, that they can offer. I mean, typical neural networks uh, would uh, keep adding. Uh, they have a very complex internal structure. So they won't be able to provide explanation that for which particular features or which particular reasons they are uh, giving a particular judgment. So somewhere we still need to keep those things uh, in our um, uh, when we are taking any decisions based on AI models, where human judgment and creativity still has a part to play. So hopefully machines won't take on the word. We would still be able to continue uh, using our capability, our judgment as we move into various scenarios. So that brings me to the end of uh, the presentation. I'll just take a minute, talk about Nagero, the company that I'm working with. Um, it's a 25 year old company, uh, pretty global. We have around, I think 12,000 people as of today. Uh, we call ourselves not a single, uh, no single headquarter. We got listed in Germany in 2020, December, uh, but we have look, uh, offices in uh, multiple locations all over. Uh, it's a services company. We work on a lot of different business domains, different geographies, different clients, different technologies, and emerging technologies like AI, machine learning, uh, data engineering, IoT, AR, VR, these are interesting things which are part of our portfolio like for so many others. And uh, we are hoping that this would be a great field to continue working in. Yep, so this uh, brings me to a close. Now I am happy to, I, I don't know how I did on time. I believe we have got uh, some time now. If there are questions, I'll be happy to take. Any questions, anybody? So, uh, Atul, actually, I wanted to ask us a few questions. Sure. So one was like for our students, you know, once they are basically studying these courses on AI, ML, but they are eventually they land up with jobs in full stack development. They are not able to really crack those jobs as a newbie. So, I mean, uh, why is it that, you know, the trend is that you need people who are in this industry for a longer period with experience to be, you know, uh, actually, it's not easy for a freshbie to get into these streams. So is it true or, I mean, uh, are we looking wrong? Okay. Um, so I'll um, explain it this way. This is still uh, an emerging space. There are a lot of things happening, but if you look at, so um, I'll what I'll uh, share here. Uh, IT industry is, of course, looking for so many people across technologies. Emerging technologies, particularly AI and machine learning, has a lot of potential, but still it is a very small part from an industry perspective today. Even when you are looking at data science, decision sciences in general, as I was sharing during the presentation, data engineering is still taking the bulk of revenue. So what 
I have seen in my experience, uh, almost 70% of the jobs are uh, even within decision sciences or data sciences are related to data engineering like cloud, ETL, uh, uh, Power BI or Tableau type of profiles and maybe 25-30% requirements even for data jobs are in AI, AR, AI ML and uh, proper algorithms type of things. So if you look at the overall ecosystem, uh, maybe uh, despite the fact that it is a very high growth field, it is uh, compared to say uh, Java, .NET and traditional uh, software systems, it is a small chunk and within that small chunk, also from an industry perspective, pure AI is still smaller. So that is where I think the challenge is, while a lot of uh, students today are keen to be in this space, when industry looks at people, they still have to do a match in terms of how the business needs are, right? So it's not that there is a dearth of opportunity, but from an overall ecosystem, it's still uh, it's emerging. Right. Okay. Thanks. So uh, any other questions from anybody else? Uh, so good morning. Yeah. Very so good. how do we deal with bad data? Like we say that garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So like if you are fetching data from data lake sort of places, then how do we deal with that bad data? Right. It's a good question. Uh, Richa, I think it's a very common challenge. Uh, first of all, I mean, data itself is a challenge. I would say even before we go to bad data, getting data is not that easy. Uh, many a times, a company do have a lot of data, lots of data in different data sources, disparate data sources. Putting it all together itself is one issue. If Even if you have data, many a times relevant data is not there. Uh, I'll just give an ex example. Uh, we were working on a machine vision problem uh, for a car company where we were trying to analyze scratches and dents on the surface of cars so that we could calculate the refurbishment value for that uh, particular vehicle, right? Now, even though the company is old, has a lot of data, but there's hardly any data which is relevant when we are trying to analyze scratches and dents on a car, right? There's normally people in the company would not have taken photographs with that intent. So that was another thing. We had to create a lot of dummy data uh, and try to annotate that data. Annotation is also another challenge. I mean, even if you have data, you have to first annotate it for the algorithms to understand it, right? I, I have not yet reached your question. Uh, so, I mean, these are also challenges when we are looking at data, how to make the machine learning algorithms understand or train them, right? Now coming specific to bad data, this is something uh, there, some where human judgment is required. I mean, the data scientists or the people in the team, particularly the business analysts uh, who are there in the team, they start playing an important part. Uh, you have to uh, and uh, master data management. If you have heard, MDM in itself is now becoming a big exercise. And a lot of these companies, like healthcare, pharma, are doing a lot of MDM uh, for their the data that they have before they actually use it to train algorithms or use it, for, use it for analytics. So to a large extent, this problem has to be currently dealt either through uh, human judgment or some tools like MDM type of tools, which are able to identify anomalies or something which is looking weird in that data set and su suggest it to the analyst to take an action. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I have one question from sir. Sure. Yes, Go ahead. Sir. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask that, like, say, for example, everybody is now more or less dependent on the machine learning part or the AI. And I also working in somewhat in the cybersecurity and I'm using AI, obviously, as a significant component in the ideas and everything that we develop. 
mm-hmm. but like what about the adversaries like there is a concept what we call as adversarial machine learning so these days what we are seeing like their people and the attackers are using and crafting some packets okay and they are specifically attacking a machine learning model so suppose is there was a malware that has been to be detected as a malware but now with a higher confidence it is being detected as a benign sample or a clean sample so what are the cases how the companies are specifically uh using some tactics to uh just encounter all these things from the attacker's perspective like what how the adversaries can be stopped in case if they want to attack the machine learning models being deployed because it's also a significant thing that we are seeing these days um so i would be candid we have not yet faced anything from a production system point of view where we are uh, addressing this very proactively we did see uh, hackers uh, use our um, uh, cloud instances to run things uh, without our knowledge uh, so i mean they would use the computing power on cloud uh, uh, without our knowing and we were faced with a big bill from the cloud provider those type of things we definitely faced and we had to take some actions uh, to address that as a concern uh, uh, in terms of uh, hackers who are trying to impact the machine learning algorithms maybe we have not faced it so frequently or in our context because we are uh, targeting enterprise solutions we are working for our clients who have their own uh, data security their own uh firewalls for on which the systems are implemented these are not like public facing uh, solutions right and typically hackers would be more interested in offering uh, 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 i mean hacking things which are out there impacting a lot of uh, public media type of things right um so i won't have a very good answer here anand uh, i'll have to excuse on this one but i think uh, uh particularly this is a challenge for sure uh, which would be uh, uh, which we need to address as i shared in, even in our case particularly we uh, saw people just snooping in and using our cloud instances without our knowledge so i mean that is something we definitely faced okay sir thank you any other questions from anybody Uh, Dr. Shivendu, are you here? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. So I would request you to say a vote of thanks to uh, Mr. Achal Agarwal. Oh, ah, uh, it was complete. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, thank you, thank you so much for giving this chance. And uh, I was not prepared, but again, uh, after uh-huh. listening to all this uh, machine learning talk to you, uh, what I have observed that uh, machine learning has its own application, right from biomedical to food to even in uh, biomedical. Once I had a chance to visit the Boston, uh, uh, it was a biomedical side uh, domain of Boston uh, Scientific. So they were in robotic surgery, and uh, what you have represented is quite well. so i don't know how to say formal vote of thanks but obviously <laughs> i would like to um, i would like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting you and giving us a chance and opportunity to hear you and your excellent uh, presentation to give you a bird's eye perspective of machine learning obviously in a talk we can't be the expert but you have given a bird's, bird's eye perspective the eagle's eye perspective so thank you so much for this and again i am thankful to the csmu university our honorable vice chancellor sir uh to allow you so that we will be uh, pleased to hear you and obviously we are glad to hear this thank you thanks a lot dr sir so dr. thank you achal it was wonderful as usual like uh, you know it's <laughs> always a pleasure to hear you and uh, incidentally i wanted to share he's my brother so <laughs> so you know i would really couldn't stop myself from saying that so i'm always proud to have him here and you know wherever wherever possible i try and bring him and he's always there so yeah. It it was my pleasure entirely, and um, yeah, good that you brought it up, Rashi. Uh, so <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Uh, anything, and we'll be happy to connect uh, individually also. If anybody has any questions, more from an industry perspective, I mean, there is a lot happening here. I don't. Uh, I mean, uh, I might have given some idea, and I wanted to keep it light today. 
but there's a lot uh, across domains i mean healthcare retail i mean you name the industry and there are stories that are being built uh, using all these algorithms so would be happy to uh, connect help in whatever way uh, i can even going forward thank you so much so lovely having you and i hope uh, there'll be students who will have a lot of queries so whenever you have time i'll just probably you know share your email with them Sure. And whenever you get time, maybe you can just, you know, reply them a little bit if possible, right? Definitely. Will do. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks again. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Okay, then. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, thanks everyone. So we'll meet in the next.